Kevin Martin here at UT Admission Sky for the third installment on the Fisher case. In the first episode, I talked about the history of affirmative action. The second episode dealt with the facts of Fisher versus UT 2008. And this episode is dealing with the arguments for affirmative action and against affirmative action. UT makes two basic arguments. They say affirmative action is good because it increases diversity. And they also argue, secondly, they do it because they can. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled in 2003 through the Grutter decision that race it is a factor in uh, the admissions process. So the first argument about diversity. So uh, research indicates there are educational benefits for increasing diversity in the classroom and also on universities' campuses. Um, for example, uh, especially in 1996, when the Hopwood decision was being released, research was done to see what the, the demographic and racial makeup of classrooms were. And research indicated that there was uh, very little minority representation inside the classroom and that there was pressure for minorities uh, to, to speak on behalf of their entire racial group, right? So it's he's saying an African-American must speak on uh, amongst all African-Americans, which is sort of fundamentally unfair. And um, Justice Powell, for instance, on educational benefits says, um, diversity furthers a compelling state interest that encompasses a far broader area of qualifications and characteristics uh, to which racial or ethnic origin is just one single but important element. And therefore, it would be unfair for one African American to speak amongst all, and that we're all, uh, you know, better off by hearing different opinions in the classroom, that, that decreases stigmas, offers different perspectives, and so on. Um, the second argument that UT says is, is we do it because we can. And, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, is, is one who's a big proponent of affirmative action, says that yes for diversity, and yes, UT is constitutional. Uh, she was the one person of the seven to one decision who uh, basically said, like, I don't care if the Fifth Circuit messed up. Uh, I still think affirmative action is good anyways. And her argument boils down to, uh, in 1997, when the top 10% rule was released, uh, the state of Texas claimed it was race neutral. Um, but the reality is it was never race neutral. Um, you know, the, the educational landscape in Texas is, is already, is still very segregated. You have uh, suburban high schools that are predominantly white um, and, and, and also Asian. We have inner city high schools that are predominantly Hispanic or African American. And she says that, that these designations were, were based on this knowledge of the layout of high schools in Texas and that, it's, that race has always been a factor. Um, therefore, it makes sense that race should still be a factor today uh, because it's, it's fundamentally uh, part of the top 10% law to begin with. So now on to the Fisher side. I mentioned in the second episode that the case is really not about UT not really about Fisher. In fact, if Fisher does win, her damages that she claims is, is simply a reimbursement of her application fee. And so the arguments are not really should Fisher have gotten in or not gotten in because no one's really arguing that she should have gotten in. Um, but it's in fact this, this general conversation of should affirmative action be used in the college admissions process. And I'm going to look at Clarence Thomas. Um, in the 2013 decision, Thomas said, well, the Fifth Circuit messed up um, but if I were to rule on affirmative action, here's what I would say. And Clarence Thomas makes four arguments. Um, the first argument says that the Constitution forbids racial classification entirely. And he goes on to say, The Constitution abhors classification based on race because every time the government places citizens on a racial register and makes race relevant to the provision of either burdens or benefits, it demeans us all. So if we, for instance during World War II, where we interned Japanese Americans, um, basing kind of all Japanese Americans based on this one classification. Um, the Korematsu decision ruled that, that we could kind of in turn um, put Japanese Americans into camps, essentially. So he says, if, if on the one hand we say racial classifications are a burden, we also can't on the other hand say, or use racial classifications for a benefit. So it's a constitutional argument uh, against affirmative action. The second argument, he disputes UT's uh, UT's argument that um, universities and the state have an interest in promoting diversity. Clarence Thomas says there is no compelling interest in promoting diversity, and he, and he sets this threshold very high. So he says that, that the only time you could promote diversity or have a compelling interest to promote race is if there is some threat for national security, or if that UT would have uh, be in an existential crisis or cease to exist if there was no use of race in admissions, which is just sort of, a, of an impossibly high threshold that no one would ever argue that that if UT can't use race in admissions, then we can't 
that UT would cease to exist. And Clarence Thomas goes on to say that the Constitution does not pander to faddish theories of whether race mixing is the, the public interest. Um, so he says that UT he can't make that argument. Um, but thirdly, Thomas, he disputes educational benefits entirely. And he goes on to say, uh, the worst forms of racial discrimination in the nation have always been accompanied by straight-faced representations that discrimination helps minorities. If you look at previous arguments made in the 1800s or, or in the early 20th century, you know, people would say things like slavery is good for Africans, or sort of civilizing them, providing education for, uh, for, for people that were taking on boats and, and uh, kind of making kind of indentured labor. Uh, and, and, and even in Brown versus Board of Education, people argue that segregation is good for black students. And so Clarence Thomas argues that, that racial engineering through admissions hurts whites and Asians because, because they're denied based on their race, which is what Fisher argues. Um, but it also is, is causes injury to students who are admitted, uh, students admitted based on, on their race or the color of their skin. Um, Clarence Thomas, there was an argument uh, shortly after the war arguments in December 2015 that sort of made the rounds on Facebook and had a hashtag like, don't be mad, Abby. And, and what Clarence Thomas said, he goes, he goes, neither the university nor the 73 briefs in support of racial discrimination has presented a shred of evidence that black and Hispanic students are able to close the substantial gap during their time at the universities. And, and so what Thomas is arguing is that, uh, is that on the whole, minority students are not prepared to enter into elite institutions like the University of Texas. Um, and, and, and it's this idea of mismatched, this, it's called mismatching theory, where you have unacademically uh, kind of prepared students entering into elite environments. Uh, and that's what Clarence Thomas was saying. It's not an endorsement of, of what he was saying, uh, but simply an explanation for, for the logic behind it. And he, and he goes on to say uh, that there is some evidence that students are, who are admitted as a result of racial discrimination are more likely to abandon their initial interest in becoming scientists and engineers in favor of less rigorous, he calls less rigorous areas of study, um, citing education and social work. Um, and in fact, there is an overrepresentation of minorities in education and social work, um, and, and less students overall in things like engineering and science. And so what Clarence Thomas was saying, and again, I'm not justifying his arguments, just simply explaining it, is that if you have a student who goes to a less rigorous university, they're more likely to uh, continue their education uh, in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or, or, or pre-medical routes than if they go to a place like UT Austin. So that's what Clarence Thomas was saying, um, and that's one argument to dispute the educational benefits of diversity entirely. Uh, and fourth and finally, the argument that Thomas makes is he says that that affirmative action is a form of discrimination and that it stamps black and Hispanic students with a badge of inferiority. He argues that if, if some students are admitted based on their race, then people have a tendency to assume that all minority students are based on their race or their skin color. And so it's this sort of subconscious, you know, you're in a classroom, uh, you have a couple black peers, and you think to yourself, ah, is this, uh, did this person get in here based on their race or because they were academically qualified? Or are they here because they're athletes uh, or the color of their skin? And that whenever you have some students who are, who are admitted based on their academic qualifications, overwhelmingly so, uh, there's always this tendency to sort of question, like, do you really belong here? And Clarence Thomas argues that this is harmful to minorities uh, because it doesn't actually make for an inclusive environment, which is what UT Austin says. So if you have more uh, minority representation, we're going to have a more inclusive environment. Um, but, but similarly to how if someone is promoted, um, you know, that if there's affirmative action in the workplace and someone interviews for a job or receives a promotion um, and they are a minority and affirmative action is used, you know, people will on a, even on a subconscious level question um, whether they belong there as a manager or in this case belong on the University of Texas campus. So these are the, the arguments, uh, both on the official side and the UT side. Uh, I think it's interesting to look at Clarence Thomas uh, kind of against affirmative action because he's an African-American justice. He's dealt with issues of race. Um, and this is something he's, he's obviously thought about and experienced his entire life. Um, and this is an endorsement one way or the other. I just think it's interesting to see exactly what is being said to justify race and admissions one way or the other. Um, in the last episode, I'm going to talk about how race is actually used um, in the admissions process. Thank you.